Okay. Uh, so for those of you that don't know me, my name's Christian. I'm one of the third year uh, emergency residents. And uh, my talk today is intravascular contrast in the emergency department. To start off with, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Vinecourt for supervising this project, uh, Dr. Knapp for his input on the presentation aspects, Dr. Worrell as well, special thanks to him for providing some of the statistics specific to the Ottawa Hospital, and also his insight on CT radiology, and Dr. Kozar, who's done a lot of work on uh, prevention of contrast-induced nephropathy. From the Department of Radiology, Dr. Shabana and Dr. Sheikh for providing guidelines on this topic and also their insight. And from the Nephrology Department, Dr. Hiramath, who's considered one of the foremost experts in contrast nephropathy. So I have uh, four main objectives for you today. First, we're just going to cover the basics of contrast. This is something we give an awful lot to patients. And so we're going to cover the basics of why they're important and what type of contrast we use at the Ottawa Hospital. And then I'm going to talk basically for the rest of the uh, presentation about some relative contraindications to contrast or complications of contrast. And so I'll go over some of the controversies and evidence with contrast allergy and also talk about some of the controversies and the most recent evidence on contrast-induced nephropathy. And finally, I'll briefly touch as well on uh, metformin use and uh, contrast and where the controversy lies there. So just to... Um, just to have a poll with the group here, I want you to consider a one-month period at the Ottawa Hospital, okay? In a month at our emergency department at the Civic and the General, I want you to raise your hands if you think we order about 500 CTs, roughly. Anybody think we order 500? Put your hands up if you think we order about 750 CTs. Okay, so a few more hands. Put your hands up if you think we order 1,000 CTs. And keep... Keep your hands raised if you think we order more than 1,000. Okay, so a minority are correct. And so to illustrate the importance of this talk today, I've got some statistics from our center. So this is a retro retrospective study by Dr. Worrell and coworkers. In 2010, they looked at a two-month period. This is the civic and the general combined. You have 2,700 patients that got a CT scan. That works out to one in every seven patients we see in our emergency department. Of that number, another 5% had a second CT scan. A more recent study in 2012 looked at the mean rate of CT ordering amongst our emergency physicians, and so that works out to 14%. So the individual rate of scanning per emergency physician at our department can range from 6 to 26%. If we look at our American neighbors, in 2008, it was estimated that 18 million emergency CTs were ordered. Okay. So the reason I'm presenting this data is because from this, if we order a lot of CT scans, we can infer that we also order a lot of contrast for our patients. And that's why I think this talk is going to be very important for you today, is because we're going to go over the most recent evidence to best guide us to give optimal care for our patients. So first, we're going to just start off with some basics of CT scanning. I've shown the electromagnetic spectrum here to highlight a unique property of X-rays. So they have a shorter wavelength, but higher energies. And it's the higher energies of x-rays that give it a unique property, and that's the ability to penetrate materials. So how do we generate images for our patients? Well, basically, there are three possibilities when the x-ray beam leaves that detector. The first possibility is that it can pass through the patient unchanged. The second possibility is that it may be scattered in different directions. And the third possibility is that it might be absorbed by the body's tissues, and this is termed attenuation. And so then this gets transported to the, the detectors. And so at the Ottawa Hospital, we use a 64-slice multi-detector CT. What that means is that the CT scanners we use have 64 detectors. So with one revolution around the patient, 64 acquisitions are obtained. And so this allows for thinner slices that allow for uh, reformats from the original helical scan to give sagittal and coronal cuts. And so as you can see here, the image in a CT scan is, is transferred digitally. As, as you can see, there's a, a pulmonary embolus at the right pulmonary artery. So the most important thing is, well, how does contrast exactly work? How do we distinguish structures? Well, the degree of attenuation of the X-ray beam is heavily dependent on the number of electrons in its path. And so the number of electrons in the path of the X-ray beam are also dependent on three main things. The first two is just the tissue thickness and the density. Those are things that we can't alter. The third, however, is the atomic number. So let me give you a very basic example. Think about a CT scan where you're looking at bone versus soft tissue. 
We know that soft tissue contains elements of low atomic number, whereas bone contains calcium, which has a higher atomic number of 23. And so there's natural contrast that exists, allowing you to distinguish between these structures. So what about if we're thinking about an organ? So look at the uh, liver, for example, and the, and the blood vessels within it. How do we distinguish those structures? Well, if we inject iodinated contrast, well, this contains iodine of a much higher atomic number of 53. And so we're, we're artificially introducing contrast to help us arrive at critical diagnoses for our patients. Another thing to consider is the types of contrast that are available. So obviously the ideal contrast agent would be biologically inert, and you could use the smallest volumes possible to get good pacification. When you're considering, obviously this type of an agent doesn't exist, but when you're considering key properties, one is the osmolality of the agent, which is just the concentration of dissolved particles. And so compared to serum, there are three types of uh, contrast agents we can use, which are high, low, and isoosmolar contrast, with the latter being the best tolerated by patients, but the most expensive, and where high osmolar contrast is the least well tolerated by patients. At the Ottawa Hospital, we use ISOVIEW 370. This is a low osmolar contrast agent, and the 370 just refers to the concentration of iodine in milligrams per mil. If you're curious about the doses that we give to our patients in the emergency setting, for a body contrast enhanced CT, this is 60 to 70 mils of contrast. If you're ordering a specific PE protocol, this is 40 mils of contrast, and rarely do we ever go beyond 90 mils of contrast for patients, so pretty small volumes. And finally, it's important to think about, now that we understand how contrast works, well, where is it best used? Now, the first sentence here is probably the most important, because if you're thinking about complications due to contrast in our patients, the best prevention is obviously not to give contrast in the first place. And so if you're really concerned about a patient who's high risk, it's best to talk to our radiology colleagues to, to consider if there's an alternative test available. So in terms of evidence-based indications for contrast, I came across the American College of Radiology Appropriateness Criteria. This was developed in the uh, mid-1990s and is continually updated. There's more than 200 pathologies covered, and they give very evidence-based guidelines on what uh, uh, constitutes the best test to arrive at a diagnosis. The use a numerical score is shown on this slide. So anything that's rated eight or nine out of nine is considered the highest indication for using that test to arrive at a diagnosis. So let's think about 13 pathologies for chest and abdomen that we see in the emergency department. And so I've listed them all here, and the ACR criteria lists contrast-enhanced CT as an eight or nine out of nine for all of these indications. Obviously, we have to take this with a bit of a pinch of salt because in Canada, for example, if you have a young patient with, a, with suspected appendicitis, perhaps an ultrasound is more appropriate. So where is contrast useful? Well, it's useful in any kind of inflammatory disorder, including pancreatitis, diverticulitis, and appendicitis. The, uh, the caveat there is there's a growing body of evidence to suggest that you can actually use just um, uh, the absence of contrast, CT, uh, to arrive at diagnoses of things like diverticulitis and appendicitis. It's also useful for tumors. So consider a patient with a small bowel obstruction where the obstruction is secondary to a tumor. You'll get increased enhancement uh, if, if, it, if it is indeed a tumor. Um, and you'll also uh, need contrast for any kind of vascular pathology. So if you're considering a rupture, a thrombus, or a leak, that's where you'd also definitely need contrast. I've highlighted some conditions in blue, and that's because the ACR criteria mentions the additional use of oral contrast as an option. Uh, suffice it to say, when I talk to our radiology colleagues, we do not use oral contrast in any of these conditions, except for an astomotic leak. So if you have a patient who's had a recent partial bowel uh, resection with an end-to-end -end anastomosis or their post-gastric bypass and you're worried about a leak, then you would, you would indeed order oral contrast to detect this pathology. So now that we've gone over the basics, let's start with a case. This is a 70-year-old female, and she was at home and had some nausea, vomiting, and some mild diaphoresis. And on history, she reports a sudden onset of central chest pain radiating to her back. On exam, vitals are stable. Her exam is essentially unremarkable, and a sub xiphoid ultrasound view of the heart does not show a pericardial effusion. You order an AP x-ray, which shows a query widened mediastinum, but of course this is an AP view. You decide that the best test for this patient is a CT with contrast to rule out an aortic dissection. However, on her history, she reports an allergy to iodinated dye, and I'm sure we've all seen patients who say they're allergic to iodine dye. So some questions you might ask yourself is, well, how do I best risk stratify this patient? 
What is the best evidence for premedicating such patients? So I'll start by discussing the pathology, and admittedly, it's incompletely understood. But the most widely accepted mechanism is that it's an anaphylactoid reaction, meaning it is not IgE-mediated, but instead, the contrast agent itself directly causes mast cells and basal fills to degranulate, uh, releasing vasoactive substances such as histamine, leading to symptoms that mimic type 1 hypersensitivity reactions. <clears throat> this is taken from our radiology guidelines, and these are the high-risk factors that you should be considering. So if a patient reports any of these symptoms within 30 minutes of receiving contrast in the past, they are considered high-risk and they should be premedicated. And so these are our guidelines. Uh, I should also add, if you have a patient with a history of poorly controlled asthma or atopy, they also have a five-fold increased risk of a contrast reaction. And in, the, in those cases, it's up to you as a treating physician on whether you would like to premedicate these patients. So let's start off with some evidence here. And this was a systematic review published by Tramer and co-workers in, the, uh, in BMJ in 2006. And their clinical question was simply, does premedication prevent severe contrast reactions? Uh, they searched five electronic databases and only included randomized trials that had a placebo or a control group and ultimately arrived at nine randomized control trials, four that looked at just corticosteroids, four that looked at antihistamines, and one study that looked at a combination of the two. This is a busy slide, but I'm going to walk you through it here. So anything to the left of the y-axis favors premedication to prevent a contrast reaction. If you just eyeball the forest plot, it seems like overall there seems to be a benefit with premedicating patients to prevent a contrast reaction. But I want you to pay careful attention to all of the numbers in parentheses because this is the percentage incidence of each reaction. And so what you, I think the most important thing to take away from this slide is that, the most, uh, that most of the life-threatening reactions, such as hypotension, laryngeal edema, and angioedema, are less than 1%. So this is a very rare condition. Also, I would caution uh, interpreting the pooled results in this Forrester plot because there was a high degree of both um, statistical and clinical heterogeneity. There was clinical heterogeneity because he used different medications at very different dosing intervals. A strength of this paper was the search methods. So they did an exhaustive search looking at the gray literature and searching for unpublished studies. And so I think it's unlikely that they missed any, any studies that would have significantly influenced these results. The second point is that they used very clear definitions. And so I'm referring to this table here, which was used by Lasser and coworkers, and this was the biggest trial involved in this uh, systematic review. It was more than 550 patients. And this is how they defined an allergic reaction. So you can see they've used composite outcomes to gr for a grade one, grade two, or grade three reaction. I think that these were largely arbitrary and uh, probably not indicated uh, for the following reasons. When you're considering a composite outcome, the individual frequencies have to occur at the same rate, and they didn't report any of the individual frequencies. The second thing is your composite outcomes have to make uh, sense in terms of measurability. And I would argue, for example, that a rise or a fall in blood pressure is not well defined. And furthermore, they have to be of equal importance. So for a grade three reaction, the assumption here is that angioedema would be as important as a, as a rise in blood pressure, which I don't think is true. So what the authors did in this systematic review is they actually had an allergist and an anesthetist come together, and they went through every individual case individually to look at if the symptoms really constituted a life-threatening reaction. And so I thought they did a good job of that. One of the limitations to the study is its generalizability, because none of the studies involved an emergency department population. And finally, as I mentioned, because of the high degree of statistical and clinical heterogeneity, I would caution interpreting the pooled data. So conclusions that we can take from the systematic review of the topic is that it's a rare entity. As another example, in the 1990s, uh, a Japanese study looking at more than 300,000 contrast injections found that the incidence of severe contrast reactions was just 0.04%. As I mentioned, there's a high degree of heterogeneity among studies in this area, so it's difficult to interpret pooled results. But the, I think the most important thing here is you've got to identify your high-risk populations because they stand to benefit the most from premedication. Switching gears slightly, I'd like to talk about a medical myth that still persists, and this is the thought that a patient that's allergic to seafood is also going to have a higher risk of being allergic to contrast. To illustrate the fact that this still persists, this is a study by Beattie and co-workers published in the American Medical Journal in 2008. They surveyed 231 physicians 
who were either interventional uh, radiologists or cardiologists. And basically, 69% of respondents said that they specifically ask a patient if they're allergic to seafood. A further 37% said that if a patient said, yes, I'm allergic to seafood, they would either withhold contrast or pre-medicate. So Shabelman and coworkers actually addressed this very question in a systematic review in the Journal of Emergency Medicine in 2010. They had a clinical question, uh, which was basically, does the type of contrast agent or a history of seafood allergy predict a worse uh, contrast reaction? And so they had two independent reviewers that found four articles relevant to their clinical question. Only one specifically addressed um, seafood allergy. And so this was a paper by Shahadi and co-workers. So this was a paper by Shahadi and co-workers in 1975. Um, and so they looked at 112,000 contrast reactions. Of that number, only 5% had an actual reaction to contrast. And of the people that were allergic to seafood, only 15% had a reaction. But when you compare that to people that had different types of food allergies, asthma, or a prior contrast reaction, you can see that the numbers are no different. And so this, the bottom line is that a seafood allergy does not predict increased risk of a contrast reaction. The American College of Radiology, the Canadian Association of Radiologists, and the Ottawa Hospital all use the same guidelines. So basically, if you have any of the high-risk factors in your patient, as I mentioned before, you would give emergency premedication with solumedrol IV and Benadryl one hour prior to their contrast test. Another option is to omit steroids altogether, although the guidelines list this as being less desirable. So to summarize contrast allergy, we know that it's exceptionally rare in terms of the life-threatening occurrences, and that the most important thing is patient selection. So if you truly have a high-risk patient, that's the patient you're going to premedicate, and the pretreatment strategy would be an antihistamine and a corticosteroid. So to resolve the first case, you ask the patient what their reaction to contrast was, and they tell you that they had hives, lip swelling, and that they vomited. And so a reasonable plan there would be 40 milligrams of solumedrol IV plus Benadryl 50 milligrams IV one hour prior to their contrast test. I should also mention, too, that another reasonable option would be to discuss with your radiologist maybe getting a TEE or another study where you're not having to use contrast. So now we're going to start with the second case, so switching gears to the main part of this talk. You have an 80-year-old male with a chief complaint of abdominal pain. They have a history of hypertension and diabetes, and as you can see on the screen here, the patient's in atrial fibrillation. On exam, the patient's writhing in pain on, on the stretcher, and there's poorly localized tenderness with not really any clear peritonitic findings. As the lab work indicates, there's leukocytosis, an elevated lactate, the INR is normal, and of course the serum creatinine is 175. You decide that the best test to rule out mesenteric ischemia would again be a CT abdomen pelvis with contrast to rule out this diagnosis. But of course you might be wondering, well, in, in light of the fact that the patient's creatinine is 175, is my patient at risk for contrast nephropathy? How do I define it, and how bad is it really for my patient? And what is the evidence for pretreatment, and what do the current guidelines tell me? So we're going to talk about that today. To illustrate the importance of this topic, Levy and co-workers published a cohort analysis in JAMA in 1996. They looked at data from 183 patients who developed contrast nephropathy with 174 paired controls. Uh, and so they found a starkly different in-hospital mortality, mortality rate of 34% versus just 7% in the controls. The incidence of contrast nephropathy in emergency departments is highly variable. It's anywhere from 2 to 12%. And this is understandable considering patients coming in with acute illness, pre, uh, differing comorbidities, and of course different volumes of contrast might be used. Interestingly, McCullough and co-workers published a study in the, in the American Medical Journal in 1997. They looked at over 1,800 patients undergoing PCI and found that the incidence of contrast nephropathy in that population was 7%, but the percentage of patients that actually went on to need dialysis was just 0.8%. So the bottom line is that there is a clear association between contrast nephropathy and poor patient outcomes. Where the controversy lies is that some clinicians and researchers believe that maybe contrast nephropathy doesn't directly cause increased mortality or the need for dialysis, but that it might be a marker for increased uh, poor patient outcomes. 
So let's talk about some definitions. First of all, there's a clinical definition, which is basically a sudden deterioration in renal function after the recent administration of iodinated contrast in the absence of another nephrotoxic event. What that basically, you can see where the problem in that definition lies, because of course there are many other reasons for acute kidney injury in our patients in the emergency department, such as sepsis and hypotension. The research definition, and this is the most widely used definition in the literature on this topic, defines contrast nephropathy as a bump in the creatinine of 25% or more from baseline, or an increase of 44 micromoles per liter at 48 to 72 hours post-contrast. And you can see a problem with the research definition because this re really focuses on a disease-oriented outcome and really doesn't focus on patient-important outcomes. And so this is one of the challenges in the literature. There's also some controversy about what is the best marker that we should be using to predict risk of contrast nephropathy in our patients. And so to illustrate this, I've taken the slide from the National Kidney Foundation that gives you three patients of varying race, age, and gender, and they all have the same serum creatinine. But when you calculate the estimated GFR using the MDRD uh, formula, and you can all use this on MedCalc on your iPhones, you can see that the, the creatinine clearance is vastly different in all three patients. And so the argument is that we should actually be using the MDRD formula to be uh, predicting risk of contrast nephropathy in our patients. The converse argument is that the estimated GFR is less accurate with acute illness or extremes of age. So in the ED setting, what are the challenges in the literature? Well, first of all, there's a very, appears to be a low incidence of patient important outcomes. There's a problem with the definitions, which I've already covered. And also patient selection is an issue because most of the big studies on this topic actually look at patients undergoing elective tests or, or cardiac angiography. So Traub and co-workers published a paper in the Academic Emergency Medicine in January 2013. And uh, the purpose of their study was to examine any individual risk factors for contrast nephropathy in our emergency patients. This was a retrospective case control study at a single, single tertiary care hospital. They looked at 5,000 patient charts as, as these patients had had a follow-up creatinine 48 to 72 hours later. And they found the incidence of contrast nephropathy was 7%. Based on this data, they then compared those patients to 1,500 randomly selected controls and developed a list of risk factors, as you can see on the screen, for contrast nephropathy. Unfortunately, when the authors tried to develop a clinical prediction rule, they couldn't develop a rule with a high enough degree of accuracy. One of the limitations of this study is a significant selection bias. So I was initially impressed that 5,000 patients from eMERGE had a follow-up creatinine until I realized that 98.5% of the included patients were admitted to the hospital. And so we're missing a big uh, selection of the population that might have had a contrast test and then were sent home from the emergency department. We also might be underestimating uh, the value of the elevated serum creatinine as a risk factor because we don't know how many patients came to the emergency department in this study and had a very high serum creatinine and therefore had contrast omitted. And finally, there's a significant degree of attribution bias. Again, we're assuming that acute kidney injury in these patients is actually due to the contrast, whereas it might be due to many other things in our acutely ill patients, such as sepsis and hypotension. But in 2011, the Canadian Association of Radiologists released consensus guidelines. So on, on this screen, you can see the list of risk factors for contrast-induced nephropathy. Some individual points to note here is that renal disease also includes a single functional kidney, that vascular disease includes hypertension, CHF, or a history of peripheral or uh, coronary artery disease, and that nephrotoxic drugs would be things like aminoglycosides, vancomycin, loop diuretics, and um, NSAIDs. So now we're going to talk about prevention of contrast nephropathy. To illustrate how difficult it is to, to study this topic, the two main modalities that I'll be discussing, N acetylcysteine and bicarb, you can see for NAC, for example, there are more than 40 randomized control trials and 17 systematic reviews of meta-analyses, and the similarly high numbers for bicarbonate. I'm also going to briefly talk about dialysis and its potential role in preventing contrast nephropathy. And I'll note here that there are other measures such as theophylline and ascorbic acid that have been studied, but I won't be talking about them in any further detail today. So how might n acetylcysteine work to prevent contrast nephropathy? Well, the postulated mechanism is that the patient gets contrast injected, and this causes a direct uh, renal endothelial tubular cell injury, 
What this leads to is hypoxic vasoconstriction and then a cellular reperfusion injury. And so what you get is a generation of harmful oxygen free radicals and oxidative stress. And so that's why N-acetylcysteine is thought to work for some clinicians because it's a free radical scavenger, it's a glutathione precursor, and it's even been postulated to have vasodilatory properties. Another thing that's attractive about its use is that it has a very benign side effect profile. This is a table taken from Rosen's that shows the side effects of NAC. And so for PO NAC, as we all know, the big thing is because it's so unpalatable, uh, nausea and vomiting is pretty high. For IV NAC, the rate of mild anaphylactoid reactions is 2 to 18%. And severe anaphylactoid reactions have an incidence of just less than 1%. So let's start with a paper in favor of N-acetylcysteine. And this was a landmark study published by Teppel and co-workers in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2000. They basically had 83 patients and random, randomized them to either PO NAC or placebo. And so you can see what the NAC protocol was there. It was given two days prior to an elective contrast-enhanced CT. The results are shown on this slide. Basically, uh, nine patients in the control group versus just one patient in the NAC group developed contrast nephropathy. I think more importantly, though, look at the drop in the serum creatinine. That's just 0.4 milligrams per deciliter, which works out to roughly 35 micromoles per liter. So that's a pretty modest drop in the serum creatinine for these patients. The other thing that I think is important, too, is that none of the 10 patients that developed contrast nephropathy went on to require dialysis. A strength of this paper is that they used fixed doses of contrast at volumes similar to what we would use at our center and also an intravenous route. And also, in this paper, they had no loss to follow up. A limitation would be the small sample size, not power to look for patient important outcomes, and that the protocol would not be generalizable to the emergency department because, of course, we don't have the luxury of premedicating patients two days in advance. Um, Unfortunately, they excluded patients with acute kidney injury. And I, I say that's unfortunate because those are the patients most likely to benefit from uh, premedication to prevent contrast nephropathy. And there's also a limitation in terms of surrogate markers. So does a rise in creatinine of more than 25% actually translate to a need for dialysis uh, or increased mortality? Following this paper, there was the RAPID study by Baker and co-workers. This was published in the American College of Cardiology in 2003. Uh, they basically looked at the same thing, but this time they, ha they gave IV NAC, um, and they gave it just 30 minutes prior, so under more urgent conditions, so 30 minutes prior to contrast being given. Again, the outcome was contrast nephropathy. Looking at the results, and the clear bars here are the patients that received N-acetylcysteine, and as you can see, impressively, there's a drop in the creatinine at 48 to 96 hours later. And uh, for the baseline group of patients that just got saline, you can see there's actually a rise in serum creatinine. But if you take a closer look at these numbers, you can see that that drop in creatinine was only 10 micromoles per liter, so it's a very modest drop. I've constructed a two-by-two -two table to illustrate the results, which is impressively that the relative risk is just 0.28 if you got N-acetylcysteine. This trial was halted early for benefit, and importantly, again, none of these 10 patients that got contrast nephropathy ended up requiring dialysis. A strength of this study would be the time frame to pretreatment. So this is more generalizable to the emergency department setting. And uh, they excluded patients with normal renal function, which I think was a big strength as well. A limitation, however, was its generalizability in terms of the fact that they use very large contrast volumes. So patients got up to 250 mils of contrast, which is almost four times what we would give for our patients in the emergency setting. And this was a truncated randomized control trial. So when I looked at the methodology, they actually had no formal stopping rules in place or stringent uh, p-value criteria to guide the investigators on when to stop the trial. And so I think that uh, the rapid study and the initial landmark study by Teppel were small studies that may have overestimated the effect of N-acetylcysteine. So let's switch gears to now some more current literature. This is the ACT trial. This was published in circulation in 2011. And they had adults undergoing coronary angiography, uh, randomized to either getting PO NAC or placebo. Again, the outcome was contrast nephropathy, but I think more importantly, they had a secondary composite outcome of death or the need for hemodialysis. So finally, a patient important outcome. Again, this is a two by two table to illustrate the results. They had 2,300 patients in the study and the relative risk was just one. They also did multiple subgroup analyses, including age greater than 70, a history of diabetes, a history of renal insufficiency, or if you got more than 100 mils of contrast. And all of those pre-specified subgroup analyses showed no difference in the treatment effect. 
So I felt that this was pretty powerful evidence that perhaps N-acetylcysteine does not help prevent contrast nephropathy. A more important slide, I think, is looking at patient outcomes. As you can see, the incidence of death or need for hemodialysis was very low in both groups. And as this graph shows, at 30 days post-randomization, there was no significant difference between the two groups. The strength of this study would be the large sample size power to look for patient important outcomes and its methodology. They fully explained, uh, explained uh, blinding, uh, concealment allocation, and had a very low loss to follow-up of just 1.5%, which is pretty impressive when you consider there were 2,300 patients in this study. A limitation would be the contrast type. 20% of the patients in, the, in each group got uh, high osmolar contrast, which we know is less well tolerated in our patients. That being said, the distribution between the two groups was equal. Another limitation would be the time frame as patients were pre-medicated 24 hours prior to getting contrast, uh, so that would not be generalizable to our patients, and an arterial route was used. But finally, just this past November 2013, we had an emergency uh, department-based paper, and this was by Traub and co-workers in the Annals of Emergency Medicine. And so they looked at emergency department patients going, undergoing contrast CT as a routine part of their care. And they included patients if they agreed to have a follow-up serum creatinine 48 to 96 hours later. As you can see, patients were randomized to placebo or IV NAC, and the outcome was again contrast nephropathy, but with a secondary outcome, which was the need for renal replacement therapy. I'm showing you this study flow diagram just to illustrate the point that in both groups, so in the, uh, in the NAC and, and placebo groups, there was a 9 and 12% uh, loss to follow-up respectively because those patients didn't get follow-up blood work. And so it's plausible that because a significant number of patients didn't get their follow-up blood work, this could have influenced the results. Nevertheless, here are the results. Uh, and basically, they found overall that contrast nephropathy only occurred in 26 patients, so that's just 7.3%. The highlighted numbers at the top is just the baseline serum creatinine. It's in milligrams per deciliter, but that is normal. And the highlighted numbers at the bottom show you the incidence of contrast nephropathy as a percentage in parentheses. And as you can see, the incidence between the two groups was very similar. Also, of the 26 patients that had contrast nephropathy, none of them needed dialysis. They did do a pre-specified subgroup analysis to look at patients that got more than a liter of fluid. I did find that, yes, there was a much lower incidence of contrast nephropathy of 3.3% versus just uh, versus 13% in those that got less than a liter. At this point, that would just be hypothesis generating. Uh, this trial was also halted early for futility at the second pre-planned interim analysis. But when I looked at the methodology here, they did have formal stopping rules in place. And so I think this lends more validity to the decision to stop this trial early. The strength of this paper is, was, of course, we finally had an ED-based study on this topic. And they used a pragmatic design. They allowed the physician to hydrate patients as they saw fit. Um, and when you looked at the volume of fluids given between both groups, they were equal at about 1.4 liters. One of the weaknesses was that uh, they unfortunately had a low-risk population that they involved. And so I think this study would be more powerful if they only included patients with some degree of renal insufficiency, as those are the patients that are going to most likely benefit from pretreatment. Um, also, again, there's an issue with a surrogate marker, and uh, the, the loss to follow-up, as I'd already discussed, uh, could have definitely influenced the results. So the bottom line here is the most current literature is telling us that N-acetylcysteine is not useful for preventing contrast nephropathy. So now let's switch to bicarbonate. So um, sticking to the theme of oxidative stress, I'm showing you the Haber-Weiss reaction here. This is a reaction that naturally occurs in all cells and generates harmful hydroxyl-free radicals. And so um, because of oxidative stress and the generation of free radicals, we know that this reaction is optimally active at an acidic pH. And so the theory is by alkalinizing the fluid with bicarb, you can actually decrease the number of free radicals and decrease the incidence of contrast nephropathy. So I'll start first with a landmark paper by Merton and co-workers in JAMA 2004. This was in favor of bicarb. They had adults uh, that were included if they were undergoing cardiac cath, CT, or TIPS procedure. And uh, those are the protocols as shown on the slide. The outcome, again, was contrast nephropathy. I've constructed a two-by-two -two table to show you the results, which impressively had a relative risk of just 0.12, a risk reduction of uh, 12%. And uh, only nine patients, though, as you can see, um, ended up getting contrast nephropathy. This trial was, again, halted early for a benefit, and none of the nine patients required renal replacement therapy. 
So what I want you guys to do, now that you've seen um, the results of this study, raise your hands if you think this is practice changing. Did not a single person think this is practice changing? Okay, so it was. These are the guidelines from the TOH, uh, from our hospital in 2005, specifically stating the Merton paper's results as a rationale for using bicarb instead of normal saline to prevent contrast nephropathy. So this was indeed a practice changing article. Um, so a strength of this paper was that they used the same contrast in all patients. All patients had well based, uh, matched baseline characteristics between the two groups and the time frame of just one hour prior to contrast for pre-medication was appropriate. The weakness, however, would be its generalizability, as the majority of patients in the study underwent cardiac angiography. And this was, again, a truncated randomized control trial, which, again, lacked formal stopping rules or stringent criteria to guide the investigators on when to stop the trial. So it seems like the Merton study might have overestimated the benefit of bicarb. So let's look at a synthesis of results. And so Dr. Hiramath is here today and Dr. Brar did a systematic review and meta-analysis on this topic. Their clinical question was simply, is bicarbonate superior to saline to prevent contrast nephropathy? And so they had three independent reviewers who searched three electronic databases, and there was also, again, an exhaustive search for unpublished trials and gray literature. And ultimately, they found 14 randomized control trials, six of which were unpublished. Again, this is a busy slide summarizing the results. But uh, in this plot here, um, anything to the left of the y-axis favors bicarbonate. So the trials I've highlighted in yellow are two trials that found a significant benefit with bicarb. The trial at the very top in yellow is the Merton study, which I've already discussed. And the trial at the bottom is a study by Masuda and co-workers, uh, which was also a truncated trial where they did not have formal stopping rules. And so again, these are two trials that were stopped early for benefit and might have overestimated the benefit of bicarb in these patients. The three trials in red are the largest studies uh, on this topic, and they all found no benefit with bicarb. And there's three small studies in green that I've highlight highlighted that all show a significant uh, effect with bicarb. However, there seems to be a lack of small studies that show a benefit with saline over bicarb. And certainly in this funnel plot, you can see that there's a collection of studies um, over here which suggest that there's small studies that show a benefit with bicarb, but a lack of small studies that show a benefit uh, with normal saline. And so this suggests a possible publication bias. So what do our guidelines tell us? Well, ultimately they say for our emergency department patients, we should be empirically hydrating these patients for renal protection with 300 to 500 cc's of normal saline. And the indication there is if, is if your patient has one or more risk factor for contrast nephropathy. Furthermore, there's no evidence to support the use of N-acetylcysteine and that although bicarbonate is an option, it's not being shown to be superior to saline. If we look at our Ottawa hospital specific guidelines, this is what you, you should do for your patients. First, calculate the estimated GFR. If it's less than 30, you have to pre-medicate these patients. And furthermore, you should probably be talking to our radiology colleagues about if an alternative test is available. If the estimated GFR is between 30 and 45, and they have any one of the risk factors listed on this slide, then they should also be premedicated with just normal saline for, for hydration. So the final modality that I'm going to discuss is renal replacement therapy. So some clinicians and researchers feel that dialysis might be useful to prevent contrast nephropathy. And there's three rationales. One is that, well, what if you have a patient who's oliguric and you don't want to make them anuric by giving them something that you know is harmful to the kidneys? Another rationale is, well, we know that uh, contrast contains a very high osmotic load. And so what if we risk putting these patients into fluid overload? And the third rationale is, well, what's the appropriateness of IV fluids in the first place? Um, these are patients that are already at risk of fluid overload. And so if by hydrating them to prevent contrast nephropathy, we might, we might again put them into fluid overload. So to address this question, Song and co-workers published a, a meta-analysis on this topic in the American Journal of Nephrology in 2010. They, uh, they basically found nine clinical trials that address their clinical uh, question of whether dialysis will prevent contrast nephropathy. There was a high degree of both clinical and statistical heterogeneity. And by clinical heterogeneity, I mean there was a big variation from the time that the patient got contrast to the time they were dialyzed. This ranged anywhere from less than 20 minutes to up to three hours. And there was also a high variation in the duration of dialysis, anywhere from an hour and a half to four hours. 
Ultimately, they found that there was no benefit with hemodialysis, but that patients that got CRRT did have a benefit in preventing contrast nephropathy. So let's just look a little bit more in detail here with this forest plot. At the top, again, I caution interpreting the pooled results due to the high degree of heterogeneity. But that being said, for the hemodialysis studies, you can see overall there's no benefit. If you look closely at the CRRT studies, you can see that they're both by the same author. And when I looked at the studies that this author did, um, they basically, none of these patients were dialysis patients. So every patient in these trials ended up having a line put in for dialysis, which you know has its own morbidity. Um, so at this point, I think I would exercise caution in thinking that CRRT would prevent contrast nephropathy. Our Canadian guidelines basically say, for, for these patients, consider renal protection in those with some residual function. By renal protection, they don't mean dialyzing patients, they mean hydrating them. The American guidelines, which came out in 2013, say that there is absolutely no need for urgent dialysis after iodinated contrast, with the caveat being if you have a patient who becomes fluid overloaded, then of course they would need dialysis. So to summarize the prevention of contrast-induced nephropathy, for N-acetylcysteine, there is no benefit based on the most recent literature. That for bicarb, it's not been shown to be superior to normal saline, and that dialysis certainly is not indicated to prevent contrast nephropathy, but might be indicated in your fluid overloaded patient. And finally, ultimately, the IV fluid of choice is normal saline. So to resolve the second case, you cal calculate the patient's estimated GFR, and based on a GFR of 35 and, and one risk factor, which is diabetes, they're classified as such, and so you, you would then pre-medicate with 250 cc's of normal saline, both before and after their contrast test. So now we'll move on to the final topic, and this is, a, this is another case here, a 65-year-old Asian male who complains of abdominal pain. He has a history of diabetes and diverticular disease, and on exam, vitals are stable, and he has isolated left lower quadrant tenderness with rebound. White count is elevated, and, and so is the serum creatinine at 130. And you decide that the best test for your patient is going to be a CT to rule out diverticulitis, and the radiologist would like to use contrast. Your learner states, well, isn't metformin contraindicated in patients that are receiving contrast? And to back that up, she pulls out the product monograph, which specifically states that patients on metformin should not receive contrast. So you might ask yourself, well, why is it that patients that are getting contrast shouldn't be taking metformin, and what's the evidence behind this? So the problem is that there's something called metformin-associated lactic acidosis. And while admittedly this is a rare condition, when it does occur, the mortality can approach 50%. So this is very bad for patients if they develop it. There are three postulated mechanisms as to how this occur. The first is renal insufficiency, where you'd have decreased clearance of both metformin and lactate. The second is hepatic insufficiency, where metformin would, in, would, it, would inhibit uh, hepatic gluconeogenesis, for which lactate is a precursor. And third is that in the small bowel, glucose is converted to, uh, to lactate, and that's encouraged by metformin. If you look at the manufacturer recommendations in 2011, that's exactly what they say. If you have a patient that's on metformin, stop it if they're going to get contrast, and don't let the patient take it again until they get their renal function rechecked two days later, and only if their renal function is normal. You can see how cumbersome this would be to our patients when you think of the sheer number of patients that we see that take metformin. So what does the evidence tell us? Well, a systematic review on this topic was done by Gorgon and co-workers in radiology in 2010. They had two main goals. The first was to look for any guidelines in the literature that would help us uh, concerning this topic. And then they had a second uh, outcome, which was to do a literature search on any studies where the primary outcome was metformin-associated lactic acidosis. To assess the quality of the guidelines, they used something called the AGREE instrument, which has six variables, including clarity and rigor of development. So these are the results from this systematic review. I've highlighted the Canadian uh, guidelines there, as they were one of five selected. And the Canadian guidelines did score quite highly for clarity and presentation, but as you can see, all of the guidelines scored poorly when it came to rigor of development. But of course, this made perfect sense, because when they actually did a literature search, they could only find five studies on this topic, and all of them were case reports. And so basically, there's a lack of literature to help guide us into uh, how to best uh, approach these patients. So what do the Canadian guidelines tell us? Well, they suggest the same thing, but only for patients with a creatinine clearance of less than 45. 
So if that's what the estimated GFR is, then yes, you would step, stop metformin at the time of contrast and recheck their renal function at 48 hours. You can then restart the patient's metformin as long as the increase is not more than 25%. So I think this is a little less conservative and probably more practical for our use. To resolve the third case, you calculate the estimated GFR based on gender, race, and age, and it's 51. And so for this patient, you actually would not need to stop contrast. To finish this talk up, I'm going to just talk about a new protocol that's coming to the Ottawa Hospital. This is a one-page um, handout that can be given to patients only for those with a creatinine clearance of less than 45 that are going to get a contrast test. And so you just have to simply write down the date of the contrast test and what their serum creatinine is. If the patient's taking metformin or any anti-inflammatories, you should, you should instruct your patient to stop taking those. And at the bottom of the page, there's instructions for the family doctor. So the family doctor will then recheck the creatinine. If it's elevated more than 25% at two to three days, then repeat it in another three to five days. If it's still persistently elevated, then they can be referred to the kidney clinic at the Ottawa Hospital. Again, note that this only applies for an estimated GFR of less than 45. And thanks to Dr. Kozar for providing this as he's been working on this with several others. The expected rollouts to be determined, but it will be sometime this year. So to summarize, I've talked about contrast media in terms of why it's important, why it's critical for our patients, and what its indications are. I've then gone on to talk about contrast allergies. So again, if you have a patient with a, uh, that is considered high risk, you should premedicate with Benadryl plus or minus a steroid. And then I've gone over contrast-induced nephropathy, which ultimately the most current literature has suggested that it's just normal saline that's really going to be most protective for our patients and that dialysis is not required. And finally, for metformin, what the indications are to stop. So now I'm open to take any questions. Thank you. Yeah, so the, when you look at the protocol, it's mixed with patients that are inpatients and also emergency patients. So that wouldn't apply to us. It should, you should be premedicated just an hour prior. Yeah. Yeah. In recent years, radiology has started giving our patients who are on metformin a handout advice that they need to take IV contract. Yeah, so they actually have started to give that handout. And I think what the ultimate plan is, is that we're going to have to sort of have a discussion with radiology about how to best uh, Im implement our new protocol as well. Um, but they are actually informing their patients about renal protection. But I think that this is something that we don't often consider a lot. Like we think about radiation doses a lot, but this is a big complication in our patients. And so um, I think informing our patients best about uh, the risk for renal injury is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we should all be switching our practice if you're not already to actually calculating the GFR for our patients because uh, it gives you a better indicator of whether it, they're at risk for contrast nephropathy. Yeah. Do you know if all these um, updated guidelines are, are on the info net? Or? So the, how I came across the 2005 guidelines that had the Merton study was uh, that it wasn't updated. So that's, that's how I came across them, but they will be updated uh, with the, the latest guidelines. The 2011 guidelines that I showed you actually weren't rolled out to the hospital until January of last year. And so it's all pretty uh, recent still. Right. 
Yeah, I didn't specifically focus on it, but I did come across literature. There's a growing body of evidence that suggests that if you're doing a CT without contrast for appendicitis and diverticulitis especially, you actually probably don't need the contrast. They can still pick up these conditions, especially we're using now the, you know, our 64 slice multi-detector CT. I mean, these are like cutting edge technologies. And so we're better able to pick up these pathologies without using contrast. And so um, in a patient that's very high risk, I mean, I would still push for getting the CT without contrast in that patient because they're, they're likely to pick up that diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah. The differential that you give uh, to the radiologist is also incredibly important too. Um, so I'll just speak about a quick example, which was uh, we were handed over a patient that had chest pain radiating to the back and uh, the rest of the history I can't quite remember, but they had a CT to rule out a PE. And so then the discussion was, well, it should pick up a dissection as well. And that's actually not true. This is why the differential is so key. So um, a CT a PE protocol is a single phase study, which, which means they're just looking at the pulmonary arteries. Whereas a CT dissection protocol is a triple phase study where they're looking at pre-contrast, arterial phase, and then post-contrast washout phase. So if you order a CT PE protocol, for example, you might pick up an intimal flap, but you might miss an intramural hematoma. And so you think very carefully about the type of test you're ordering. Yeah, I think a lot of the uh, earlier papers were arterial routes where you do see a higher incidence, but in the intravenous route and the smaller volumes we use here, you're not likely to see as high numbers. Yeah. Yeah, because that 7% incidence of contrast nephropathy, when you look at that 7%, then there's an even smaller percentage that actually requires dialysis or, or has some mortality. So. Yeah. Well, I have the, I had the numbers. 2,700 in two months at our, in our emergency department. So significant. Uh, Those are our yeah, specific statistics. 
So. That, that doesn't include MRIs. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.